Thank you, thank you. Welcome home, church. It's good to see you all. I hope you had a very Merry Christmas, and I hope you have a Happy New Year. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever found yourself in a battle or a fight that you could not win? Now, for some of us that have been in the military or police officers and whatnot, maybe you actually can go back to an actual battle or a situation that you found yourself in and you were just outmatched. But for others, you know, we think about maybe a relationship that we were in or we were dealing with or a, a sickness or something that transpired at work or maybe even an addiction. It's a terrible feeling to know that you have stepped into the ring and you're facing an opponent that you can not beat. Any boxing fans in the room? Got a few boxing fans. UFC, I know that's the new thing, but whatever, I'm old school. I like pretzels and not potato chips. Here's the thing. Earlier this fall, there was this fight that was about to take place. And I want to show you what happens when someone steps into the ring and they need to fight someone they can't win. Watch this. It is a heavyweight matchup. I'm going to let you know when that man fights F.A. Ajagba, do not blink. That's a bad man right there. Of his five professional bouts, four of them have been done in the first Look at this round. Dude. You heard they so said? He likes to bring an five and oh. Two opponents in quick fashion. And Curtis Hawkins nope. has walked out of the ring. Wait, not today, no, Satan. Not, not today. He's not fighting this he guy. Walked He's not out I've watched boxing a long Curtis time and have never seen that. The fans here on the side are, 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 are really upset right now because... Well, it looks good. I'm going the back to the, the locker room. Destruction anyway, so he probably saw that same portrait. Curtis Harper is on his way to the dressing room and is walking out of the ring. So I would I've say never that is seen this. You ever have an opponent like that? You ever wake up one day and you know what you have to face that day and the alarm clock goes off and you just hit the buzzer and say, nope, not today, Satan. I'm staying in bed. I'm staying right here where it's nice and cozy and it's nice and safe. We've had those opponents in life. We've had those conflicts before where as we look across the ring and we look across at what's happening in life, we are completely and totally outmatched. How do we get into this situation? Many times it's because we didn't take a good inventory of ourselves. What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What am I capable of and why? For core students who are in the source, make some noise over there, core students, where you at? For you guys, this might feel like a very long habitudes lesson, just throwing that out there, okay? But we're looking at our identity today. We're looking at our inventory today. Do I have the will? Do I have the desire? Uh, do, do I have the talent, the leadership, the training, the skill set? Do I have what it takes to win this battle? And oftentimes I see people get ahead of God and they're trying to do things on their own. And then all of a sudden everything comes crashing down. And what do they say? Where were you, God? Instead of taking personal accountability, realizing that they're fighting a battle that they have no business fighting, it's where were you, God? In this life, we're going to be outmatched at times. And it doesn't mean that we can't fight the fight. And it doesn't even mean that, we, that we're going to lose the fight. It just means that we have to take proper inventory of who we are. Can you see the real you? Now, before we get to our text this morning... I want to take some time to read some scriptures that lead up to the text, some context to help us understand what our character we're going to look at this morning is dealing with. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to Judges chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1, Judges 6, 1. And it says this, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. 
They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help, which is what I'm going to do right now. Father, I ask that you would be with me as I bring your word this morning. I pray that it would pierce our hearts, O oh God. I pray that you would draw us closer to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We see that, that common phrase that starts so many chapters, right? Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. If you know your Bible, it's, if you've read your Bibles, you know that's something you see quite a bit. But this particular time, as they, did, they do evil in the eyes of the Lord, as they turn their back and their te- on God and his teachings, this time God says, okay, now I'm going to deliver you into the hands of the Midianites, these people from eastern lands. See, the Israelites were meant to live and thrive In the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Instead, they find themselves hiding in caves because of their apostasy. The Easterners would come in and destroy their crops and kill every one of their sheep, cattle, donkeys. They invaded the land to ruin it. Now, what's important to understand here is the sheep and the cattle and the donkeys and their crops that they represented Israel's economy. And so when these eastern people would come through and they would destroy and they would pillage and they would do all these awful things to the Israelites, they left Israel not only hungry and wanting, but left them in economic ruin. They were in a desperate place. And how many of you know that when you once used to serve God and you no longer serve God and now you find yourself in a desperate place, what do you do? You cry out and you say, God, help me. Help me. And can you imagine the Israelites just crying out to God, God, help. God, we need you. We need you. We need you. Verse 7. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian. He sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from all the hand of your your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you did not listen. Verses 7 through 10, we see God send a prophet. Israel cried out, so God sends a prophet, a a mouthpiece, someone to speak on his behalf. And he reminds them of all the good he's done for them. And he reminds them of how they've turned their back on him. And it's a little different this time. It's a little different this time, God's response. God's hand comes down a little heavier. Yahweh's tone is quite different from the past times where he's delivered them. See, it's because of their covenant infidelity, they have forfeit all right to deliverance. The Lord wants them to know that if you forsake me, it doesn't mean that I am always going to give you a favorable response. It's a totally different reaction from God than we see two chapters prior in chapter 4. When Deborah, a prophetess, steps up. And she has a much softer tone. And immediately there's this plan put in place. But for whatever reason, two chapters later, God comes down with a much more heavy hand. See, God desires relationships with his people. He wants to love and he wants to be loved. He doesn't want to just be the guy that we call upon when we need a bailout guy. He doesn't want to be Dave Gambali. Where are you at, Dave? <laughs> he doesn't want to just be the guy that we call, hey, I need to be bailed out. He wants to love. He wants to be loved. This brings us to our text today. This is the setting. This is the context of where we're going to be this morning. We're going to spend most of the rest of our time in Judges 6, 11 through 16. Here we go. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash, the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon said. But if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord 
has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me. I I like how polite Gideon is here. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Here we see how things, just how bad things are. You know, in the States, we've never really had to worry about this before, right? We've never really had to worry. You never woke up in Bristol or Noakesville and had to worry about whether some army that comes in like locusts and destroys everything in your town. Right? We've ne- we, we don't know what it's like to live like that. We don't know what it's like to live under some oppressive regime. And, and here we see Gideon, he's hiding his wheat threshing in a wine press. And can you imagine every time there's a sound on the other side of the hill or every time he sees something flash or every time there's something going on, he thinks, is, is today the day? Every morning he wakes up and he wonders, is today the day the eastern armies are going to come in and pillage and destroy my family, my life? My livelihood. And what's interesting is the angel of the Lord comes in. And we know who the angel of the Lord is. The, if you continue reading in the passage, the angel of the Lord is actually the Lord himself. He says this, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> These are two things that Gideon, if, he, if they actually penetrate his ears and go into his mind, I don't think he believes either of them. The Lord is with you. Sure doesn't look like a God. It sure doesn't look like a God. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And I love the fact that Yahweh calls Gideon mighty warrior. Gideon is threshing his wheat in a wine press because he's afraid of the Midianites. How can you, can you, can you just imagine how that phrase made him feel? I don't know if you've ever been in a position in life where the career you studied for all the college you put, all the, all the years you put into education, and then you get that career, and everything is great in life, and something happens where you lose that job, you get knocked off that pedestal, and now you're forced to work a lesser job. You're completely and totally overqualified. It's humbling for you, but you got to do something to meet ends meet, and you're there, and maybe you're dirty, and you're filthy from the job you're working, and then someone, your buddy comes up to you and says, man, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Man, God is with you. We can find ourselves in these humbling places in life where someone well-meaning comes in and speaks encouragement and speaks life to us. But the eye roll can be dramatic, can it? Mighty warrior. Mighty warrior. Maybe it's because Yahweh is cloaked here or because of his current circumstances. But Gideon doesn't even acknowledge this phrase, mighty warrior. See, this is what's important and what you've got to grab onto right here. God calls Gideon mighty warrior. I can, I can be almost honest with you. I'm sure if Gideon could be here this morning, he would say, I didn't feel much like a mighty warrior. I felt more like a mighty peon. I felt like somebody that, that didn't have what it took. But see, God called a mighty warrior not because of his current circumstances, but because of who he was going to become. Here's the thing we need to grasp this morning. The Lord knows your inventory better than you do. He knows you better than yourself. He knows who you are. Gideon was completely unaware of his true identity, unaware that God could ever step in and bring about radical change. This sermon this morning is really just about identity. Can you see the real you? Who is it that God has called you and created you to be? It's about identity. And I want to read you something powerful here. This is the the one thing in this message that really grabbed me personally the most is this. One of the biggest lies as it pertains to identity is that we create our identity instead of becoming our identity. One of the biggest lies as it pertains to identity is that we create our identity instead of becoming our identity. Well, I'm going to go to this school and I'm going to work this career and and my family's going to look like this and our finances are going to be like this and I'm going to determine it and I'm going to will it and this is what we're going to be and this is who we're going to be. Instead of allowing God to move through us and reveal who we're supposed to become. Let me give you a funny example here. I I spent a lot of time working with teenagers and young adults and whatnot. And and every now and again I come across a young adult, a single young adult, who some wise sage 
has kind of poisoned their mind <laughs> and said, okay, this is what you need to do, okay? Baby girl, listen to me. You're praying for a husband, and that's great, okay? You're praying for, for a wife. Okay, that's awesome. This is what you need to do. I want you to get in your prayer closet, and I want you to pray, and I want you to write down like 20 things that you expect your husband <laughs> or your future wife to be. Okay, just write those things down, okay? And what we begin to do is we see someone that begins to compile this list of this person who probably doesn't even exist. And we see someone creating their future spouse. They're trying to create their identity. They're trying to create their marriage. I'm here to tell you I've been married 17 years. Thank God, 17 awesome years with my wife. Had she put a list together before she met me, I wouldn't have checked half the boxes. I'm just telling you. And some of the boxes that probably were checked, she's probably erased since, okay? I'm just being honest with you this morning. Any, any, any husbands and wives, we can be a little transparent this morning, right? But we try to create our future so often. We try to create our identity instead of becoming who God wants us to become. And Gideon was so busy creating his identity that was never meant for him. Or he was so busy allowing the circumstances that he lived in, that he saw every day, he allowed that to define him. And God comes in and he says, I'm with you, mighty warrior. He missed it. He was missing on becoming what God wanted for him. See, in order for you to see the real you, you have to first see yourself the way God sees you. And if you know your scripture, you know what it says about you. You know how God's encouraged you. You know the titles he's given you. You know the names he's called you. You know the way he's encouraged you. You have to know who you are. You have to see it through God's eyes. And listen, another way of saying this is that people who don't follow Jesus, who never surrender their life to Christ, will never fully understand or fulfill their calling in life. They can't. Because who you are, who you're meant to be, who you're becoming is locked inside the heart of God. And the only way to find out what it is is to get so close to him that you can touch it. You can touch him. You can reach out. And he begins to reveal these things to you. That's good preaching. I need just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. Pardon me, my Lord. Again, very polite. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Why, I'm sorry, where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? This is quite a response from Gideon. Let's break it down. I'm going to paraphrase. Um, excuse me. <laughs> but if the Lord is with us, then why are we in this mess? <laughs> this attitude still prevails today, doesn't it? We find ourselves fighting a battle we were never meant to fight. We put ourselves in positions we were never meant to be put into. And then we want to know, why have you abandoned us, God? Where did this mess come from? Why is life like this right now? This attitude still prevails today. We stop giving financially and we wonder, where's your provision, God? We stop faithfully attending church and we wonder why we have no real Christian connection. We pull our kid from youth ministry in order to do travel soccer and we wonder, why do they keep making these terrible, awful, ungodly decisions? But hey, let's blame God for everything. That's what Gideon tells the angel of the Lord. That's what he tells Yahweh. Now listen. He continues, but now you've abandoned us and given us into the hands of the oppressive people. It's so funny. We get in the car, and God wants to get in the car with us. And we say, no, 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 God, you get in the back seat. I'll drive. But then we blame him when the car crashes. You kidding me? Can you imagine how God must have felt? One of the worst things you can accuse a father of is abandonment. God's sitting there saying, wait a minute, I didn't abandon you. You're the one that turned your back on me. And now you're accusing me of abandoning? But he didn't actually say it. He probably thought it. God could have given Gideon a piece of his holy mind right here, right? But instead, he gives Gideon what he needs. He gives Gideon what, 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 listen to this, go in the strength you have and save Israel. Am I not sending you? That's his response. 
That's his response. Gideon gets what Gideon needed, love and encouragement and the beginnings of a plan. And he also reminds Gideon of something very important. The Lord has already given you strength. A follower of God already has what they need to join a battle. They are already sent. We are already sent. We already have an inventory. We already have an arsenal that's already within inside of us. Go in the strength you have. Now, there were thousands of people God could have come and said, hey, I need you to do this task for me. I need you to do this mission for me. But for whatever reason, he chooses Gideon. Because Gideon had a unique skill set that God wanted to use. Gideon was not better than anybody else. But there was something unique about Gideon. See, Gideon was crafted inside. Let me read you the scripture here. Look at this. Psalm 139, 13 and 14. You alone created my inner being. You knitted me together inside of my mother. I will give thanks to you because I have been so amazingly and miraculously made. Your works are miraculous and my soul is fully aware of this. Every single one of us were uniquely made, knitted together individually, different, separate, and then we're born. And God puts us into a family. And some of you wake up every day thinking, why am I in this family? <laughs> Why couldn't I be in that one? Because this is where God wanted you. Some of you are foster children or have been fostered or have been adopted, biological, whatever it is. God puts you where you need it to be. And he takes this combination of how he puts you together in the womb and he mixes that with your upbringing. And he puts these two things together and there's something unique. You are completely different than the person next to you, completely different from anyone else. And so he sees Gideon and he says, I need Gideon. I need Gideon. He is who God wanted for that exact moment in time. And see, look, here's what's crazy. Many believe that the more we become like Christ, the more we become like each other. It's easy to fall into a belief that says growth in Christ reduces our uniqueness, our individuality. But this simply isn't true. The closer we get to Jesus, the more unique we become. In Christ, we discover who we were designed to be. Maybe you can remember way back to when you were in high school. For you guys, that's a little easy. Unless you're in middle school. And you remember all the different subcultures. Uh, depending on what era you grew up in, maybe there were, you know, the greasers or there were the jocks or, you know, there were the emo kids or there were the punk rock kids. And there's these different subcultures of people. Listen, Christianity has its own subculture. I don't know if you know this or not, but it does. Let's think back to the WWJD bracelet, right? Let's think back to all the T-shirts, right? Is that a Mountain Dew? It's like Mountain Sinai or something. Like all these things exist, the Christian radio stations we listen to all day long, we have our own little culture. And if you don't believe me, <laughs> what I'm about to say is really funny. If you don't believe me, <laughs> thanks for laughing. You're a little preemptive there. I like that. Let's just laugh for a minute. Can we just laugh? It's good medicine. <laughs> listen, go to a pastor's conference. When you go to a pastor's conference, you can almost guess what staff position they are at their church based on how they look and how they're dressed. <laughs> For years, you could always tell the music pastors because they had like these black button-down shirts or silver button-down shirts with like flames on them or like some kind of thunderbolt that came down, came across, right? That was the music guy or the music gal. Then you had the youth pastor. His hair was always like this. He's like, what's up, bro? I'm the youth pastor. So, yeah. so you had that guy, right? You, that's a youth pastor. All day, that's a youth pastor. There's no way that guy's a senior pastor, right? And senior pastors, you know, they got that walk, you know. The, you know hey, look, Pastor Scott's got the walk. He's got the walk. Is that, is that like, it's that gangster walk that like, I'm, I'm a senior pastor. I was like, I'm a youth pastor. So, and, and there's all these different like, and you can see it on display. I, I know who that is and who that is and who that is. When Stacey and I early on uh, decided we wanted to, you know, be in ministry full time and she was going to be a pastor's wife, she looked around and she noticed 
you know, all the AG pastor's wives back at this time, you know, 17 years ago, whatever, they all have the same haircut. They all have this short bobby thing, right? And that was the style for, like, AG pastor's wives for, like, 10 years. Like, that was the thing, right? And Stacey's got, like, this long, beautiful hair. She's like, I don't want to cut my hair. <laughs> Do I have to cut my hair in order to be a pastor's wife? And you know what I said? Yup. <laughs> You know why I said that? Because I had people whispering in my ear, you got to look like this, and you got to look like that, and you got to be like that guy, and you got to dress like that guy. And there's this subculture. And honestly, it's kind of weird to see all these people look alike. Where the reality is, the closer you get to God, the more individual you should become. The more unique you should become because you're becoming self-aware of who he's created you to be. And I'll tell you what, I thank God for this church. One of the major, one of the biggest things I can brag on this church about is that Pastor Scott has allowed me to become who God's called me to be. Instead of forcing me into some weird mold that I got to look and sound and, and be like this guy. I Don't you love the five different preacher voices you get up here? They're just different. They're unique. And they all have different words. And, and, and we're not saying, well, you know, Dr. Stephanie, you got to be like this. Or Dr. Chapman, you got to be like No, we're, we allow God to move and in our, in, in our, in our pastors around here. And, and for you as well, I tell people all the time, you're here to the church. You're new. Why should I stay? Listen, this is, it's a great place to discover who God's called you to be. I love that, and I appreciate that so much about Pastor Scott. I appreciate that so much. Every one of us has this different inventory. Isaiah 64, verse 8, yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. I don't know if you've ever been into a potter shop before, but when they're trying to replicate the same kind of vase over and over again or, or whatever it may be, no matter how hard they try, there's going to be differences. There's going to be nuances. When God puts you together, when he was the potter and he crafted you, your color's just a little bit different. Your, 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 um, your, your, your uh, what do you call it? <laughs> yes, whatever you're thinking, yes. It's different than the next thing, right? It's different. And there's all these, there's all these little different things that are just different. And I love that about God. I appreciate that so much about him. See, listen, God has no desire to have a kingdom of clones, but a kingdom of individuals who find their purpose in him. Every one of us has a different inventory. We need to become aware of that inventory before we find ourselves in the battle, not knowing who we really are. But let's be honest, sometimes it's the battle, it's the fight that reveals who we truly are. There was a young man... And sophomore in high school years ago, he's on a basketball team. He was trying his hardest. He was playing ball. And he gets cut from his basketball team. That's a terrible thing. Let's have a moment of mourning. How many of you have ever been cut from a team? Come on. When I was in middle school, I got cut from a soccer team, which works out because I don't like soccer. But I wanted to play so bad, but I found out everybody on the team was Brazilian. I had no shot. Like, Brazilians learn how to kick a soccer ball in the womb. I don't know how it works. And I got outrunned, outgunned. I mean, you name it, I'm like, I'm going back to baseball. <laughs> but you get caught. But listen, when you get caught from something like that, it forces you to take inventory. It forces you to take stock. Am I good enough? If I keep pressing, am I good enough? Can I do this? And there's this young man who gets cut from his basketball team. And I, and I always pictured him kind of holding his basketball and you know, maybe his hoodie's over his head and he's walking home. And, he, and he's got to ask himself, am I good enough to be on this team? And some of you know this story. This is a story about the greatest basketball player of all time. I'm not talking about Wilt Chamberlain. I know the old timers think it's Wilt. It's not Wilt. All the modern people think, oh, it's Kobe. It's not Kobe. The greatest basketball player wore number 23 for the Chicago Bulls. His name was Michael Jordan. Okay. Michael Jordan got cut from his basketball team. Can you imagine being that close? So he gets cut from his basketball team. He had to take stock. He had to take inventory. He's holding his basketball. He's walking home. He's like, I just got cut. And if you know Michael at all, you know the killer instinct he had. If you've ever written, read, read any of his books, you understand his mentality. And I can imagine Michael walking home saying, who does he think he is? I'm Michael Jordan which meant nothing at the time except to him. We need to take stock. We need to take inventory of who we are. And I love that scripture, the way, it, the way, the way God puts it there. Go in the strength you have, the strength I've already given you. There's so much we can accomplish 
by what he's already given us. But sometimes the strength he's already given us isn't enough. Verse 15 and 16. You can look at your Bibles for this one. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. <laughs> Paraphrasing, Gideon politely responds, look, I'm a nobody. My people, my kin, my family, we're nobodies. We're the weakest of nobodies. How can I possibly do this? And God's response is, because I will be with you. I will finish what you can't. Here's the third and final thought this morning. The Lord supplements what we are missing. He supplements where we're short. I think about that young man or that young lady who now they're of driving age and they want their own car and they say, I'm going to save my money. I'm going to work my tail off. And they're washing cars or they're washing dishes or they're doing what they're doing. They're doing chores. They're getting a little job. They're babysitting. And they're doing everything they can to meet that, whatever that goal is. Let's say it's a $5,000 goal and they just want this little car, just something to get me around town. And they're working, they're working, and, and they come short. But that good, good father comes along and he says, baby, son, I see how hard you've been working, and I see that you're about $1,500 short. I want to come in. I want to pay the rest of this off for you, okay? I want to make sure you get that car. That's a perfect illustration of what God does for us so often. Where we're short, where we're not strong enough, he can come in and he brings this it factor. He brings this supernatural change. Sometimes we have the desire, the will, the passion, yet we fall flat on our face. We come up short, and it's usually because we engaged in some kind of fight or battle without God. We got ahead of him. We didn't ask him to join our efforts. We tried to do things on our own effort. We started a business. We got into a relationship. We got into something that forced us to get ahead of God. We picked a major to study without ever asking God what he thought about it. We went to a place where God did not send us. Defeating the Midianites and gaining freedom was an impossible, impossible ask. But God is a God of the impossible. And sometimes we can't see the impossible because of our human limitations. Peter in the New Testament. I love Peter. Peter's one of those guys, one of those characters in the Bible that gives me hope for myself, you know. I don't know if you're like me and you just kind of can't stay out of your own way. You know, it's like I'm really trying to serve you, God, but I keep messing up. I keep blowing it up. I keep putting my foot in my mouth. And I, I read Peter. I'm like, oh, okay, good. I'm not the only one. If you know the life of Peter, you know that Peter was a hothead. You know that he said the wrong thing at the wrong time or he didn't speak up when he should have. And he's got all these flaws and all these things. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 23, we see this encounter with Jesus. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Pause. So up until this point... Peter's been on this voyage, this, this, this faith journey with Jesus. Can you imagine? He saw the eyes opened. He saw the blind eyes open. He saw people get healed. He saw demons come out of the possessed. He saw the, the, the 5,000 fed. He saw all these incredible things. And he's on this incredible journey. And it was like, nobody can stop this guy. This is, this is Jesus. This is the Messiah. This is the greatest thing the world's ever had. And then all of a sudden, Jesus sits all the disciples down and says, hey, listen, when we get to Jerusalem... I've got to die. Wow. Talk about a record scratch, right? In the middle of a party. And it says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. I, now, I have a very vivid imagination. And when I read this, I wonder, like, how did that go down? So Jesus is there with all the disciples. And Peter's like, can I have a sec? Does he put his arm around him? <laughs> Come here, Jesus. And then he rebukes God. 
He says, never. This will never happen. Never, ever, 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 ever happen to you. And Jesus turns to Peter and he says this, get behind me, Satan. Could you be a little more clear? You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now listen, there's no doubt that Peter had a pretty good stock of his own inventory. There's no doubt in my mind that that Peter had a pretty good idea of what he had access to. But there was something that he wasn't, he didn't quite have yet. What he was really missing was the inventory that Jesus was trying to give him. Notice Jesus' response. He calls him Satan. He's basically saying, you're a problem, Peter. You still cannot see with your spiritual eyes. You see the impossible. You see the mountain. You see the obstacle. I see victory. But you can't see it. And just like Gideon failed to pick up what God was putting down, so too did Peter. And so too to many of us. That obstacle, that thing that's in our face, there's no way. I can't beat it. There's no way I can get past it. There's no way I can get through the season of life. We try so to do so much on our own that we fail to see what God's plan and purpose is for us. We force open doors and cross thresholds that were never meant to be crossed. Now, did Gideon accomplish everything God wanted him to? Some of you know that answer. For the rest of you, you can go to Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8 this week and you can continue reading on your own. See what happens. But one thing Gideon did learn, and Peter too, was that part of their inventory was a supernatural God. It's, it's an intangible. I'm a big football fan. I know, shocking to many of you. When a good analyst breaks down a football game, there's some different things they look at. Well, Team A has a better offense than Team B. And Team A has a better defense than Team B. And Team A has better special teams than Team B. But a good analyst is going to go a step further and say, you know what? There's something about Team B. And it's called an intangible. I, I can't put my, 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 my finger on it, but I just I feel like Team B is going to pull this game out. There's, there's so much heart they play with. There's so much desire they play with. There's something I can't measure that they have. And for us, we've got kind of the same thing. You can't win that fight. You got no business being in that fight. You're outmatched. The opponent's too great. This season of life is too difficult. But there's this intangible. We know it as the Holy Spirit. Something supernatural that says, yeah, you're a little short. Yeah, you're not good enough and strong enough and you don't have the skill set and, and, and the list goes on and on. But listen, I can supplement where you're short. I can help you the rest of the way. 2019 is, is an opportunity for a fresh start. We look at 2019 and we say, oh man, thank God 2018 is over. Here comes 2019. I'm going to change all the things that I need to change. I'm going to do all the things I need to do. Great opportunity. But also, it's going to present new battles. Many of us went into 2018 and we got completely blindsided by something we did not see coming. Do you have the inventory, the arsenal to deal with with what's coming in 2019. Sometimes we enter a battle by choice, and sometimes the battle ends up in our backyard. And sometimes we have already what it takes to win, but sometimes we need God to come in and help us finish this particular battle. If you could for me, please bow your heads and close your eyes as we finish. What does 2019 hold for you? Now, some of you may have an idea. You may know a little bit. But some of you may be completely clueless. I, I want us to start the year by allowing God to examine us. What do you currently have in your inventory? What are you missing? What do you need? Who has God called you to be? 
Have you struggled with the comparison game through the years? Man, well, if only I was married, life would be a lot easier. And someone else would say, well, if only I was divorced, life would be a lot easier. Well, if only, you know, my son was like their son, or, 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 or if only I had the finances. Look, we can get into this comparison game, but God put you in the situation you're in for the time being, for the here and for the now, and he still wants to use you. He's prepared you. He's preparing you for something great. We're going to take a moment. We'll be ending briefly. This band's going to sing a little song over you. And I want you to take some time just to reflect on this message, on your identity, on your inventory. Let's do it. Come on. that as we go about our week this message would resonate with inside of us Lord I pray that you would spark a desire in every single one of us to want to look into our identity more who we are who we're called to be I pray that these passages of scripture we read over today will continue to move and stir in our heart Continue to speak to us, God. For those that have kind of turned their back on you, Lord, I pray that you would draw them closer to you. For those of us who have tried to create our own future, create our own identity, I pray that you would show us how to become what you want us to become, who you've called us to be. We love you so much, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Whenever I preach, I, I really try to give us something practical to hold on to as well. I'm a firm believer in, in altar ministry or, or times like that where we just took some time and reflected, you know, and let, and let the, the message really penetrate us. But I also am a big believer in um, practical things. And listen, uh, we are embarking on a journey as a church where we are immersing ourselves in Scripture. One of the biggest problems with Christianity today is there are so many stinking, biblically illiterate people across this nation that don't really, truly know God. You ever have someone in your work office say something like, well, the Bible says this. Dude, do you even know the context behind that? Like, that's not even true what you're saying right now. We hear these things all the time. And, and so what we're doing, we're embarking on this journey and we're going to read the, the Bible together as a church. We're going to go through this reading plan. But then we're going to have these small groups where we're going to get together and we're going to discuss 
what we read. It's very organic, it's, it's, it's very laid back, and we're just going to talk about God's Word. And uh, we already had the sign-ups for leaders. We have people that have stepped up to decide to be leaders for those groups. But uh, starting next week, you're going to be able to sign up and join one of those groups. And I just encourage you to do it. I encourage you to do it. Part of our arsenal, part of our inventory, part of our identity should be a very good understanding of God's word. Amen? So do that. You are now dismissed. Go live for Jesus. We will see you next year, baby.